Jennifer Boris Engelking. Uh, legally, my name is Jennifer Engelking, but I wanted to put my maiden name because before I got married, a lot of my work was with that name. Um, I'm from Lake County. I grew up here. I grew up in Willowick. Um, my husband's from Wycliffe, so you know, spent many summers coming out to Fairport and going to the beach and visiting the town. Um, so I'm excited to come here always. And I always wanted to write. Um, since I was a kid, like I was the kid who wanted to sit and read a book and like thought of all these ideas of stories. And I remember just taking um, like computer paper and typing up a story and then illustrating it. And I'd give it to my parents and my grandparents. And I remember like one Christmas, my grandma was like, one day you're gonna be an author. And I always wanted to, but it was like, I think that was like one of the times I realized how powerful words could be. Like, she, you know, to have someone like tell you that um, and believe in you. And so I think that was really kind of the start of like planting the seed of wanting to write. Um, and even as a kid, like, you know, my parents always read to me a lot and I loved going to the library and leaving with big stacks of books. Um, so I, my first printed story, um, my aunt worked for the Lake County Historical Society and she knew that I wanted to write. So I was like 14, I think. And she let me write like about Pioneer School. Did you guys do that in grade school? No. So you go to the historical society and they like teach you how to like make candles and like churn butter, um, make cornbread, and it was just a cool experience. And so she let me write like a little column about my experience, and I it was like my first published work. Um, so after that, I knew, you know, even in like high school, I knew that I really liked to write. So I wrote for the school paper. Um, I went to Cleveland State and I went for communications and I was, um, ended up being the editor eventually of the Cleveland State or the school paper. And I just tried to do whatever I could. Like I knew I liked to write. I didn't completely know I, what I wanted to do with it. Um, but I was getting a degree in communications and I always loved, which I think is so cool about your class, like I love like the visual side of it and I love the written side of it. So I ended up going, um, graduated from Cleveland State, also with a um, minor in video production, and I went into broadcasting. So I moved to Erie for a year, I worked as a reporter, um, did all kinds of stories, and then I went to Toledo for a couple of years and I was a reporter there. And I always liked the, like, the human side of stories, like human interests, um, like the history, like I was always pushing with my news director, like, can I, I met these people, it's such a cool story, can I do this story? Um, and there's just limited space, at least when I was in news, for that kind of story. So I eventually um, decided to leave. I wanted to come back home to Cleveland. Um, worked, I worked for PBS, and I started doing, um, well, first I worked for a business show called Neotropolis, and we went and interviewed different businesses. Then I ended up getting a call um, to audition for a movie and play a reporter. So I ended up with a, a really small role in an Unstoppable, um, with Chris Pine and Denzel Washington that was like 10 years ago. And then I wanted to get into history. And so I started doing historical documentaries um, and really using a lot of what I learned reporting, like doing like short, really short stories. And I finally got a chance to like expand on it and make these longer pieces that I could fit so much more detail in um, and just make them, to me, like more interesting because I could dig into like the personal stories and like the human element of the stories. Um, so then I had taken a class after I came back and like kind of left broadcast news, um, how to write a book at Lakeland. And I became friends with the, the teacher and she was a local author, Deanna Adams. And she wrote books for the History Press and Arcadia Publishing, which publishes this book. Do you guys, are you guys familiar with them at all? They're like, if you go to the library or really any bookstore, you'll find a bunch of these. Like there's a Fairport book that you probably saw at the Lighthouse. Um, there's a book on Menor, there's all sorts of like individual like local history books across the country under this title. So there's hidden history of like, you know, Pittsburgh, um, hidden history of Cincinnati. So um, I contacted, after chatting with her, I contacted the publisher and she said, well, I'll just start by submitting an idea. So my first idea was that I was going to write a book about Willowick because that's where I grew up. I grew up like a half mile away from this. This is Willow Beach. So in the late 1800s, there was an amusement park. And actually, I should have marked the page, but if you guys go to, let me find it, um, the Willow Beach section, it is on page 38. 
there was a car coaster there. So if you're familiar um, with Willowick, at least where like Shoregate Shopping Center is, there's a big shopping plaza. Across the street now there's homes. And there was this huge car coaster in the early 1900s and people would drive their car up it and just let it coast down. Um, and you know, these are like the cars of the early 1900s, so built differently. And as you can see from the picture, there's not, not a whole lot of rail there, so it probably wasn't super safe. But um, so really the story of this amusement park and knowing it was so close to where I used to like go for walks and ride my bike, um, always like, I don't know, stirred my imagination. And then on top of it, on top of there being an amusement park, there's a shipwreck. Like it's still the third worst shipwreck on all of the Great Lakes. And it happened a half mile away from where I grew up. And that's also in here, um, just the Griffin. Uh, let's see, where is that? That is on page 30, starts on page 30. Um, so that was a story of this uh, steamship was actually, the last stop was in Fairport. It picked up some people in Fairport and everything seemed to be fine. And by the time it, it got to Willowick, which was then Willoughby, um, people in the early morning, like farmers who lived along the shore, saw a fire out on the lake. So there's this huge blaze and within distance, like very, very close to the shoreline, it got caught on a sandbar. Um, and so at the time they didn't have lifeboats, many of the people didn't know how to swim because it was like 1850. So today, a lot of people take swimming lessons. Back then they didn't. And then on top of it, like your teacher was saying, like the clothes were so different. They had heavy clothes on. They had like some say gold coins sewn into their clothes. So um, I didn't know a lot of details about those stories like as a kid, but I knew like my neighborhood had these two huge events um, that took place. So, and actually when I was your age, um, probably when I was a little bit older, I realized that I liked history because before that I thought I didn't like history. I was like, it's all memorizing. It's like memorizing dates and names. And I, I felt like I wasn't um, connecting with the backstory to it. And then I started to realize like all the books I like to read or a lot of them were historical fiction. I'm like, wait, I always liked Anna Green Gables, like Little Women, like all these stories are set in a different time and place. Um, and still today I love reading historical fiction and have some ideas of books I may write <laughs> in the future. Um, but So that really like got me to want to write a book. So the process was I sent, um, if you go to Arcadia Publishing and the History Press, there's just like a basic email. They're like, have a, wanna write a book? Email us. So that's how it starts. You're like, well, yeah, here's my idea. So my first idea was I wanted to write about Willowick because that's what I knew. Those were the stories, um, some of the stories that I wanted to find out more about. And so uh, an editor got back to me and he was like, we know we really want to work with you. This is a cool idea. Let's run it by the board, so like the official board. Um, they came back and they were like, eh, Willowick's kind of small. We're not sure how it will sell because I'd never written anything for them, so they didn't know, you know, much about how I would handle writing a book. So they're like, how about Lake County? It's like, sure, I love Lake County. Um, so I had to write a book proposal, and I mean, I'm learning all this as I'm going. I had taken the class, I knew a little bit about it, but this was like an in-depth proposal. Like, it took me a few months. Um, I have three kids uh, that are four, eight, and 10, so I've got other stuff going on in my life besides just this. But um, I had to include chapter ideas. I had to include like stories that I would put in it, actually write out sentences that they said could be used on the jacket of the book. Um, I had to contact stores all throughout Lake County. Like, if I write this book, will you guys be interested in selling it? Um, and list all the stores. I had to put like media people that I know um, who might do a story on it, or they could maybe send, um, you know, it's called a, a review book. So like a copy that they send out to media who will maybe potentially like write about it then. So um, it took me a few months. I put this 22 page proposal together, submitted it, which was very nerve wracking. Um, and they said, okay, we're gonna take it to the board again. We'll see what they say. So the board came back and they were like, yep, looks good. Let's do it, you can write it. Um, and we settled on it being Hidden History of Lake County based on the kinds of stories that I had come up with that I wanted to write about. Um, I also forgot to mention in between, so in between that point of writing a book and when I was um, in broadcasting, I was also a freelance writer for newspapers and magazines. Um, so I wrote for Lake Erie Living, I wrote for the News Herald, 
And while I was writing for them, I met a lot of people in the area and started like finding out about really interesting stories, um, like the Unionville Tavern. I went there when there was a restaurant, and it's a really historic building. Um, and when I was there, I remember it also has ties to the Underground Railroad, and that's in this book. Let's see if I can find it quickly. Um, when I was there as a reporter, I remember they took me on a tour, and there were like hallways that were really narrow that they said they would, they believed were used to help slaves escape. Um, there was also a tunnel in the basement, which like a, tu a tunnel in the basement. How intriguing is that? And huge pieces of coal. Um, that were still there from when they used to heat it with coal. And I'm talking like these big, giant pieces of coal. So that was one of the stories, like from being a reporter, I'm like, oh, that's perfect. Like I can dig into it more. I can find out more about it and include it in this book. Um, so after they said, okay, you know, we want you to write this book, the next step was I, they came up with a contract and they said, let's pick a date and you're, whole book's going to be due this date. So signed it, got all set, and I had a full year to, to write it and research it. For my books, especially with Hidden History, it's kind of daunting. You're like, stories, there are so many amazing Lake County history books. Um, and so like, my goal was to try to find stories that they didn't have the details in these books. Because why write a book that has all the same details again? Um, so I was trying to find stories like the kind that I like to read about and find out about that's like the story behind the story is what I always say this book is about. It's like buildings and places that are still around, but like what's the backstory to it? Um, so, you know, in order to do that, I realized like there's not one way to approach it. Like uh, a lot of the people I've met in Lake County, um, I would call like the Unionville Tavern. I called and I said, you know, the, the group that is restoring it now. Um, what stories do you have that most people haven't heard about? And they were restoring the tavern, and they said, well, we found when we were taking a wall apart, um, we found this old butter churner, and we think that they put it in it as a time capsule. Well, that's interesting. And then they found uh, in between like a door jam, they found an old card um, from a musician from like the 1920s, 1930s who used to play there. Um, and just like interesting little details, like they had just, uh, a it was a family member, like a great-grandson of a couple who had owned it at one point when it was a restaurant. Um, and they had like some items that were passed down over the years. And one of them was a sign that they had out in the garden. And it was connected to the Underground Railroad. And if the sign was per pointing a certain way, um, slaves who were escaping knew that it was safe. And if it wasn't, they held off. I'm like, I, who, I mean, just like these interesting things that are tied to our history. Um, so that's really the kind of stories that I tried to dig into, um, and I always feel like you you know you go to the source. Like Lake Metro Parks has the Children's Schoolhouse Nature Park in Kirtland, and I've taken my kids to a bunch of programs there. And I always thought it was a really cute building, but I didn't know a lot about it. Um, so I connected with them, and they had all these amazing old photos from when it was a schoolhouse, and they they had a poem. I'm 34. And 135, there's a picture of the schoolhouse and an old picture that I got from Metro Parks of the class in 1895. And then on the next page is this poem that was written um, by a student who then returned 20 years later to teach. And it just is like, I think it's the like sweetest story about what Christmas was like back then because Christmas is so different now. And they talk about how. Um, you know, there were candles on the trees, and one of the kids dressed up as Santa, and someone almost caught the tree on fire. Um, so those are the kinds of stories that I think are so interesting to find out about. Same thing with like, uh, I did a, they have Kirtland Country Club in here, which used to be um, a mansion. And so I contacted them and I said, you know, I know like some history about you guys, but what do people not, what, what is like something that readers wouldn't know? Um, and so they let me kind of go through their archives. They had really old books, um, their original register books of the people who started the country club. They have photos, like you were saying here at the high school, they have photos in their hallway that I hadn't seen before and they let me take pictures and then use it in the book. Um, and then there was someone who worked there and he had worked there for decades and he told me the story about how at one point there was a fire, like a really big fire there. And he said, um, 
all of the members who were there at the time ran around and they were trying to, which I don't recommend necessarily doing this, but they were trying to save some of these items. Like there was like an, a grandfather clock that um, had been part of the country club for many, many years. And they carried it out on their back. Um, it's just like interesting, it adds to like, instead of just saying, there was a fire there and you know, some pieces survived, it's like, well, what, you know, what did these people literally carry out on their backs with them? Um, same thing with Moreland Mansion at Lakeland. I went there and I got to like walk around the building and see a lot of the old photos and then they, they just told me like stories like they said um, when they were renovating, they found like a nine person, they called it a nine person bathtub <laughs> up in the archives. We don't really know what the story is with that, but they got rid of it. But a lot of the, like the servants of the time had like servant quarters upstairs um, and just like interesting stories. Um, let's see. In Fairport, uh, I love the story. I marked the page of Amy Hakonen. It's on page 101. Do you guys know that story about Amy? She was like one of the first female mayors in the country, um, and she was just very spunky. She was a mayor uh, when you know there was during Prohibition, and Fairport was a rough and tumble town back then, and she didn't like it. She said, "I'm going to try to be mayor um, in a time when women weren't," and she won in a landslide vote. And she said, I'm going to clean up this town. And she actually went and busted bootleggers who were people illegally making and selling booze back then. Um, and she went and did it herself. And she got a lot of threats. Um, a lot of people didn't like that. And she actually eventually ended up stepping down from being mayor and leaving town. But while she was mayor, she made a huge difference. Like uh, A lot of laws were made because of her being in that position. So she is on, did I already tell you, page 101 to page 104. That's her. And then, this is her with confiscated materials. <laughs> On page 104. Um, Eddie Binden was a Fairport resident. He was a crew member on the Edmund Fitzgerald which um, you know, was a terrible wreck in the 1970s. And he actually, he had been a crew member for many years and he and his wife were coming up on a, a big anniversary and he said, this is gonna be my last trip. I'm not gonna go on anymore, this is it. And unfortunately that was the last trip when the boat sank. Um, she found out later and I, I actually heard the story from his niece who lives in Wycliffe now. And he had bought a ring for his wife that he was going to give her. Uh, when he came back and he was at a port and he's like, I don't know, I just, I don't, just something feels off. I'm, I'm going to give this to a friend to keep for now. Um, so after the ship sank, she received this ring in the mail from the friend saying this was a ring from Eddie. Um, but I had found out that his niece was in Wycliffe and she was really nice. She offered, come over to my house. I have all these photos. I've actually sailed on the Edmund Fitzgerald. Um, so that's how for this book, my this is my second book that just came out, Lost Lake County, um, I ended up with photos, you know, that were just family photos. And that's really like something I try to do. Like historical societies are amazing. And I've gotten a lot of photos from them. Um, but I try to get them from people, you know, who have them at home and they're like, they've been sitting in my basement for years, what do I do with them? Like, I'll take them or, you know, take a picture of it anyway. Um, and then sometimes I just stumble across stuff. Like I was at the Metro Parks, this is page 179, and I've walked past this a million times by Buttermouth Falls, you know, going with my family. And I, I was like, what is this rock? What is this plaque? It says George Washington Elm plaque at North Sugar Inn Reservation, page 179. And so I contacted the Metro Parks just to find out about the story, found out it, it had an interesting story behind it, um, that there was a, a shoot from a tree that was believed to be where George Washington once stood, and they were sent out across the country, and that was one of the locations it was sent to, and they planted it. And so now there's this rock there that most people walk by not knowing what it is, um, and I was able to dig into the story behind it. You don't know where you're gonna find a story. You know, you just like be aware of your surroundings. If something looks like interesting or different, then look into it. See who you can contact to find out about it. And for me, like, 
I always get asked, like, how do you research? Like, well, it's kind of, it's a tough, it's a tough question to answer because there are so many different ways. Like, sometimes I find information, like I said, from people I've met, and they'll say, like, hey, so-and-so is, like, the great-granddaughter of, you know, the person I'm trying to find information out about. Um, or I go to the, the source, and then sometimes I find out that there's these archives that I never knew existed. Um, the Little Red Schoolhouse in Willoughby, over by South High, they have this amazing archive uh, in a building behind the schoolhouse. And for me, it's like a dream to go in there because you walk in and there's like all these old documents and photos that people haven't touched for years. And it's both exciting and really sad because I'm almost scared to touch some of them because I worry they're gonna just start to crumble. So for me, when I'm, when I'm writing these books, I always feel this need to like get as much as I can of our stories and try to save them and try to preserve them because if someone doesn't and, and you know preserve them online or in a book form, they're just they're going to be gone. Um, so that was a really interesting archive to look through, and there's still like I could go back there and spend hours digging through everything. Um, but also like cities, like it's not just historical societies. Like the Lake County Historical Society is obviously like the big one, um, but like Willoughby has its own historical society in the library. Um, the city of Willowick, just in their city hall, has a huge archive. And a lot of it's from residents who say, like, I have this stuff, or I, I inherited it, and I don't know what to do with it. Like, I can't use it. Um, so they take it there, and they keep it in their files. And then someone like me, or someone who's just, like, interested in their family history or in the area can go in and find information. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to research. I also do a lot online, I, which I can't imagine, like, writing this kind of book years ago would have been a lot harder to actually, you know, when people had to go and physically find all the material, um, go to libraries, like dig through the old newspapers at libraries, and now a lot of it's online. So I can find different websites and search um, and find stories that way. But what I've realized is like a lot of the, the old, the older stories, like the shipwreck in 1850, I looked at a lot of newspaper articles uh, from the time that it happened and you'll find multiple articles with completely different stories. So then you're like, well, how do I know which detail is accurate? Um, so that's when you have to like try to like find like first-hand accounts and keep finding like different articles to cross-check. But like I said in my book, like there are some details that unless you're there, unless you were there and you survived the Griffith sinking, we may never know because there was a fire. The law, the ship's log was burnt in the fire. So you know. We'll likely never know how many people were actually on that ship. And some stories are just really hard to dig down and know like every single detail about it. Um, something I think is really important too is like when you meet people, like keep the connection. I, I mean, it's like a cliche thing to say, but like don't burn a bridge. You know, like I remember my parents always telling me, um, you know, keep the connection, don't burn a bridge. And it's so important because if you meet people and they have, they feel like they connect with you and they, you know, like what you're doing or appreciate it, like, and tell them thanks, send an email saying thanks, send to like, if someone got a physical card these days, like a physical thank you card, it, that for sure would go a long way. But um, I think that's really important because especially if you're, you're in a community and, you know, you're trying to find information about the people in the community, that's how you do it. I mean, for you guys too in class, like, I think you met with Dan Maxson, right? Like, he's great, and he's so interconnected with the historical society and the metro parks. Um, so all it takes is, like, one person who knows you're trying to find something, and they're like, oh, I, here, talk to this person or check this location. Um, but I've had, even years later, people I've met when I was a reporter um, or, you know, just through friends, and they've helped me with stories. Um, so I think that's really important. There's a name that I saw in a couple of um, M. Joanne Boris. Is that your mom? That's my mom. Yeah, oh, she nice. took some pictures. Yeah. <laughs> that's really cool. So yeah. yeah, she took a couple photos for the book. Yeah, my niece actually took a couple for my first book, and my mom did too. Um, she's done, she used to do video production in Willowick for the city of Willowick. So she had. Um, when they put the plaque up for the Griffith, she was there and she was like shooting video for it and doing like an interview. So I said, why, why don't you take those pictures? That would be cool since you have that connection to it. Yeah, so you kind of involved your family yeah. in 
in the book writing process and the gathering of information. My next book is actually um, that I'm working on is Lost Lake Erie, um, and I want to put Lake County in it too. But that one will be from you know the whole southern side of the lake. Um, but yeah, lots of interesting lighthouse stories in that. But yeah, what you guys are doing is super important. Um, trying to save history too and having it you know in video form and are you also writing it or shooting video yes so that's very cool so thank you for for doing that because I always say I'm like you could have so many people writing about it I mean I I would love to like I, there are so many great local authors but like have even more people writing about it because there's so much like I feel like I'm like 10 books out with the books that I'd like to write um, but there's so much that can be written about and I think like, so when I wrote this, like my goal really was to write it, n to not read like a history book. I mean, it is a history book, but to have it be like the interesting pieces and the stories and like the human side of things. So, um, because I was that kid who thought I didn't like history and I love that, you know, you're bringing it into the classroom. Like I think that's incredible. Um, because I feel like if I would have started maybe even earlier, like started to see like, how cool things are like here, like where we live, um, I think it would have kept with me uh, and stayed with me and, and started that like love of history or, uh, earlier on. Anyone else? You guys can ask me like if you're interested in reporting. Yeah. Uh, what's the most exciting thing you've learned while writing your books? My most exciting thing. That's always hurt. Someone asked me a similar question. They said, what do you think, I can't remember how they worded it, but like out of all of the lost industries and businesses, like what was the most important? And it's really, those are hard um, because something I meant to mention and didn't was when I wrote my first book, I'd never written a book. And so I wanted to put every story I found in it. Um, and I was way over my word count because they limit you. You have a certain number of words and a certain number of photos that you can put in it. Um, and so some of those stories I saved for this book, but if it makes it in, it's like something that like really um, caught my attention, that I thought was really interesting and, and deserved a place in it and should be told. So it's hard, you know, it's hard to say, I guess, what, like, which one thing is really exciting. Um, for the first one, I thought the details that I was able to dig up and kind of clarify for myself about the Griffith because it's what I grew up kind of being intrigued with. Um, that was like personally exciting for me because it was something I always wondered about. Um, and same thing with Willow Beach, but like everything I found, like the story I told about the Unionville Tavern, I'm like these are really cool details. Like this adds to like the personal side of that story that like this is how they actually did it and helped slaves escape to freedom in Canada. Um, so yeah, it's hard to pick just one thing, but that's a good question. Yeah. So is this like your full-time job being an author? So I always say like my full-time job is being a mom. <laughs> um, that really comes first for me. Like I fit this in when I can, but uh, it's like I've been writing freelance for years. So to me, it's like it's like having another freelance project, right? Like it's nice because I get to fit it in in the morning or at night or whenever it works during the day. Um, but I don't just sit like a nine to five job and just write. Um, some days I was like, you know, I think that would be really nice, but I like to have the flexibility to still be there for things for my kids and assistant coach soccer, even though I didn't play, <laughs> and um, do all those things. But I also, I pick up other writing jobs sometimes. Um, like I've been writing, they're called uh, geo radio scripts. So they're gonna use them on airplanes and they're like little short stories about when you're in a plane, like what you're flying over and like the history behind it and the story behind it. Um, so yeah, I mean it's my it's my main job I would call it, but I don't work like full time hours on it. So what like what's the writing what was the writing process like for you? Um, like as far as it's like once I have the information, how yeah. to like put it together. Uh, so that generally I get I, I kind of do it two different ways. Like sometimes I get all the information, and then I look through it like all, all my research, and then I kind of like pick out what I think is most interesting. And I think that's something that's evolved for me over many years of writing. Like when I was working in news, I could gather information in a very short amount of time, because I had to, and then I had to write it in a very short amount of time. So I just kind of got used to like immediately picking out what stood out, like what is the interesting part of the story. So now when I write, even though I'm writing a longer format book, they are all shorter stories within that longer format book. So it's kind of a similar style. 
Um, so I go through the research that I have and pick out you know, what to put in. And then sometimes as I'm writing, I'll find out more information. Like there's a, a story in my second book that just came out. Um, there was a uh, golf course also in Willowick next to Willow Beach. And the librarian at the Willowick Library, Gail Lacucci, is amazing. And she's done all this research. And she has a whole section on the website um, with you know, local history. And she called me. And I was just, I was like days before sending it to my publisher. She's like, we got this call um, from a store in Michigan, an antique shop. And they found this trophy. And it's a women's uh, trophy. And it, it has a woman's name on it. It says Willowick Country Club. And so she started doing research, and we realized that the country club, and this was, again, in the early 1900s, was having a tournament for women. And the name of the um, tournament was Humphrey, who we think was, if you guys know what Euclid Beach is, um, that was a big amusement park. We think it was the Humphrey family who started Euclid Beach. So it was just like a cool connection. So like my, I don't have like one writing process that I always stick to, because I've gotten used to like, if you get something last minute and you think it fits, maybe you take something out that you don't think is as interesting or as important and then put that other detail in. Um, so it varies, like story to story. Did that answer? If you have follow-up questions, feel free. What was a, one of your favorite, or just an interesting, hum, one of your human interest stories that you covered while you were in uh, journalism or broadcasting? Ooh, one of my favorite ones. Um, so I was out covering a story. I think it was like some weekend event that was coming up. It, um, I don't remember even what the initial story that I was supposed to be covering was. But I, I was standing there and I was talking to a few people. There was a, a, a thunderstorm. I was supposed to be live. And you can't go live if there's a thunderstorm because they put a big tower up and that's not safe. Um, so we were just chatting. And I found out that the gentleman I was talking to um, was a World War II veteran. And he was not just like a World War II veteran, which that is amazing in itself. He was involved in this huge rescue mission that no one really knows about um, called Operation Halyard. And he was the radio man in it. So he literally like jumped out of a plane over enemy territory during the war. Um, he had all the people in the village in Slovenia help hide them. And you know, I talked to him about this whole story. And he, there were other veterans who also helped in this and there's a book written about it but for some reason it's not it's not like taught I don't know why like in school but um, I talked to him I'm like oh, I would love to interview you I'd love to like find out more about this and I went back and I talked to my news director and she agreed like that's a really great story so I ended up tracking down several of the other veterans who were semi-local I was in Toledo at the time so he was in uh, Finley so like middle of Ohio by the lake we found a couple from Michigan, we found someone from Cincinnati, and we found someone from the Pittsburgh area. And there was a local, it was called the Experimental Aircraft Association, it's a group of people who like to fly small planes, basically. Um, and they agreed to fly them all together for me to interview in one spot. Um, and both my parents, uh, or not my parents, my grandparents were in the Army in World War II. Um, they actually met in the Army. And so it's like it's always been uh, a time period that interests me. So to sit though with these men who are I mean like true, true heroes, like they jumped out of a plane, they were hidden by people who lived in this community, and then in the dead of night they built an airfield and got back out on a plane on a very short runway. Um, and this was the first time they've been together since they did this. So for me to like just be a part of that and just like sit and let them talk was like. One of, if not the coolest, one of the coolest stories and most meaningful for me um, that I've ever done. Um, so that might be a long well, <laughs> answer, but that's really neat. yeah, I actually, I did, that's one of the stories that I think would be interesting to like dig into even more. Um, and I've kept in touch. Many of them, unfortunately, have passed away, but I've kept in touch with the daughter of one of them, um, and she's shared some extra information with me. Would so I'll make them out in a book someday. Would you share that video with us? Do you have it somewhere published online? Or? Yeah, you know, I, I'll have to find it. It used to be on like a lot, like I could find it really easily online. Um, I did that one, it's probably, it's been a while. So I'll have to look. Yeah. I know, I have it in my own archives, but yeah, I'll definitely share it with you. But the book's really interesting um, to read too. It's called The Forgotten 500. If you guys ever get a chance, I highly recommend it. And he's in it. Uh, his name's Arch Billion.
and Curtis Styles is another one. Any other questions? Yeah. Did you have like a mentor or anyone like you consulted with when you were writing the book? Yeah, I, I mean, I've been so lucky to have um, a lot of mentors over the years, like when I, I interned at Channel Five for like two years, they joked I was I was their longest intern, I, and it was for free, and that was part of what I did to like try to get the experience um, of being in a newsroom and having something to put on a resume. Um, so when I was there, Stephanie Schaefer was like a big mentor for me, um, and then uh, Wendy Hope. I was uh, when I was at Cleveland State. There's a group called the Society of Professional Journalists. And um, I ended up being president of like the student chapter, and she was president of the Cleveland chapter. Um, and so, you know, she helped me a lot. And then, as I said, like Deanna Adams, who writes local history for the History Press and Arcadia Publishing, um, she writes a lot of books about like rock history um, and music. And she's been great. Um, you know, I've gone back and forth with her and, and met with her and chatted, and she's helped me out um, when I've had questions. So yeah, I mean, I, that's why I always like, I was so excited when you asked me to come here because like you guys, I mean, feel free to, if you have questions past this, feel free to email me. My, you all have a bookmark and that's got my website on it and I have my email on there and that goes directly to me. So if you think of something later um, or, you know, even a few years from now, if you want to get into writing in any form, um, I would be happy to help you guys because I think that's really important to have people who've been through it and, you know, you can bounce ideas off of. I mean, that helped me a lot. What would be one thing that you would recommend to the students that are in this class about, like, careers or jobs? Well, I guess it depends. It has changed. I, I mean, broadcasting has, I would say, in the past 10 years, um, has changed and opportunities have changed, but it's still as important as it ever was, right? If not more important to do it. Um, I, I guess it depends, like, there's so many different areas, like, there's, like, news, there's, you know, the production where you're, uh, it's more entertainment, or it's, like, a documentary. So it depends on the area you want to get into. Um, a lot of people, you know, you obviously need the experience, like, you guys are getting that now, which, that's amazing that you're getting this so early, um, and you can build on it, and put it on your resume. If it's something you want to get into, like, do what you can, like, ask to shadow people. If there's someone who has the job you want, contact them and say, like, I want to have your job one day. What do I need to do to get there? Um, can I come follow you at work one day, even if it's for, like, a few hours? Um, that would be really helpful. I would say try to, if there's groups that would be related to what you want to do. Like, I was in the Society of Professional Journalists, and I met so many people as a student in college through that that I still connect with today. Um, Tom Moore, WTAM, he was in the pro chapter, um, and I, you know, have known him all these years, and a lot of other professionals that are in the industry. Um, and I would also say, because it, it's changed, like, now there's so much, as you guys know, like, online and social media, like, you can also start your own thing. Like, so many people have started their own, you know, blogs online, or, like, podcasts, or, you know, anything like that, like, Start it now and build on it, and you have something to show. Like, what you're doing gives you something to show. So I think that's one of the most important things, is to just, like, do it. Like, if you want to write, write. And even if years later you look at it and you're like, oh, I could have done a better job, like, that's fine. Because, I mean, I look at my stuff and, and think that, but it's part of the learning process. So don't be afraid to, like, try it. Don't be afraid to, if you want to get into, you know, video and shooting and editing, do as much of it as you can on your own time, and then eventually you'll have something to show to work into the jobs that you want. Um, if that answers, I mean, that's my biggest thing is like, I've worked, I've done so many things just for free, just to get the experience, because that's part of what you do to get to where you want, to where you will get paid for it. Um, and make connections with whoever you can who's in the industry that you want to get into. Um, don't be afraid to reach out, don't be shy, because like, I would love to help. I mean, I'm I'm here saying like anyone who needs help, I would I would be happy to help you guys. So I know there's a lot of other people like me who feel the same way, who've had that help, um, and want to like help other people get to the same spot. Because it's a long road. I mean, people will be like, oh yeah, you, you know, you just wrote a book. I'm like, yeah, it is my first book, but I've been writing for like decades, like years and years, and like building on it and building on it and writing different styles like to get to that point. Um, 
So just keep writing and shooting video and editing and doing what you can. What do you think are some of the most important skills for young people today? You said you have a four, eight, and a ten-year-old. These Everybody here is probably 15 and up. Okay. So some graduating in a couple of months, some just kind of starting, you know, second year of high school and whatnot. What do you um, think are some of the most important skills that they should have, you know, as a writer, um, for those interested in writing or research or archiving or video, all of those things? I think now more than ever, skills are important, but it's like, your attitude, your focus, your determination, your willingness to work that will take you super far. Because some of those things, like it's it's important to learn how to write. That's something, and for me, I can't say like, I just I just took a class and I learned how to write. You know, it's something that took like years and like of me doing it my own way. Other people will approach a book like this and like handle it completely differently, but I do what works for me. Um, but I would say like, working really hard and you know, showing that you're willing to work hard in anything. Um, especially right now when there's so many job, you know, shortages and, uh, you know, people saying like, oh, people don't want to work. Like, if it's something that you love and you're motivated to do, you just will do it um, because you love it. And it also shows potential employers, like, that you're willing to do more. Um, but it's like keeping up with technology, too, like, doing what you guys are doing and learning how to do as much as you can, even if you don't. If, if you want to, say you want to be uh, an anchor, you want to go into news and you, you just want to be on TV and you don't ever want to like edit or write, it's important to know how to edit and write because you have a better understanding of the story um, and what you need to do to get there. So I think like learning as much as you can even around what you want to do, um, like you know if you want to write, learn how, what does an editor do? What's the process for that um, is important because it all interconnects. It gives you a better understanding just of the industry you want to get into. And if you're like, like I said, if you're thinking about getting into something, you don't know if it's what you want, I think the best way um, to get like first hand experience is either to like do an internship or just like see if you can follow someone for a few hours just to see what their day is like. Anyone else? No? How much of the design did you do here on the book? So that was um, one of the pictures that I've loved for a long time of Willow Beach. And then my editor, th this cover, this cover is exactly how they sent it to me. It was super easy. I was like, yep, yeah, looks good. I like it. This one, the, the publisher will send a copy of the de design, you know, of the cover, and you have to approve it. Like a very official, yes, I approve this. Um, and it was in black and white. And I like the black and white. But I felt like because it's on Lake Erie and you couldn't, there wasn't like a line to differentiate that, this could have been a cliff anywhere. Um, so uh, actually a friend of my dad's, um, Jim Dudash, who lives in Mentor, he actually colorized it. And I just wanted, like, I'm like, I just want to touch like a color. I don't want it over colorized. And I think he did a really great job on it. Um, so that changed from black and white to color. And then the back picture, this is a really amazing local photographer, also in Mentor, um, Andrew Cross, AC Aerial Photography. And I had like two smaller pictures. I was like, eh, it's kind of hard to tell what it is. Um, so we ended up going just with like this big color photo. And we actually went back and forth about like, do we put this on the front? Which I thought would look really striking with the colors. But we felt that it, it didn't capture like the story of the book, that, that his, obviously there's history behind this, but it's a modern photo, so mm -hmm. we went with a historic photo. I just love the, the magnifying glass. That's part of their, um, like all their hidden history books have that. Okay. So it's kind of like easy to identify, grab a story. So there's hidden like, history of. Yeah, yeah so, place. right, and all of their lost, this is a newer um, version. Their older ones looked a little bit like, a little bit more ornate, like along the edges, but now they have this big like lost in the middle. So they're different series are easy to, to find when you're at a I library see. or a bookstore. Hello everybody, I'm here with local author Jennifer Anglecane. So Jennifer, could you tell us a little more about yourself? I can. Um, yeah, I grew up in Lake County. Um, I grew up in Willowick and uh, love Fairport. I've been coming here since I was a kid and I've always wanted to write. Um, I always wanted to write a book like when I was a kid and I would make them 
for my family and I would illustrate them. Um, and so years later, I went to Cleveland State for communications and um, for video production and ended up working in broadcasting for a few years. I worked in Erie for about a year and a half uh, as a reporter and then I went to Toledo to the CBS stations. And I liked reporting, but I never got to really dig into like the human interest side of stories like I wanted to. Um, so I left, came back to Cleveland, ended up doing historical documentaries for PBS. Um, and then I took a class on how to write a book. And so it took me uh, you know, a number of years to get there, but I ended up um, approaching the publisher, the History Press and Arcadia Publishing with an idea. They told me um, put together a book proposal and approved it. And so that was my first book. In History of Lake County, Ohio, which came out uh, in April 2021. Uh, and then my second book just came out in August of this year, and it's called Lost Lake County, Ohio. So I say, like, my first book is like the story behind um, places that still exist in some form, and then Lost Lake County is like the story behind industries and places that are gone. That's really cool. So, like, how, when, like, when did you get into like history? Um, I would say, like, I never really knew uh, as a kid that I liked history. I actually thought I didn't like history because to me it was like, you know, taking tests and memorizing names and places. But all the books that I like to read, um, or a lot of them I realized, like, as I was probably in high school, maybe college, like, I'm like, oh, those are historical fiction. I do like history. Like, I like the story, um, you know, the human side of history and like finding out the backstory to it. So that was something that's always been intriguing to me um, in anything that I've done. You know, even when I was a reporter, I did always enjoy doing like the feature stories um, and same thing with doing like the documentaries, like being able to like dig in a longer format into local history um, is fun for me. So when you bring up your report, what, what do you think like the most impactful story was when you were reporting? Um, I would say, I think it was when I was in Toledo at WTOL and I had a chance to bring together a number of World War II veterans um, who had this really incredible story. They were uh, basically shot down in their plane over enemy ter territory, jumped out of the plane. Um, they had the townspeople who hid them to keep them safe. Um, and then they built a runway um, and they escaped back to the U.S. on this short runway in the middle of the night. Um, and so to be able to sit with these men, I mean, real, like, real true heroes and have them all be together, and it was the first time they had even seen each other since the war, um, and I was able to like call some of them and arrange that they could all be in one location for me to interview them, it was just like amazing to just sit there and like see them together, hear their story, like the firsthand accounts. Um, that I would say is one that will always stick, stick with me from reporting. And the, the, uh, it was called the Operation Halyard um, was the mission that they were on. So with Operation Halyard, where, where were they? Like, where were they? So they, they, were, um, they were shot down. Um, it was over Slovenia. And yeah, and at, you know, at the time during World War II, they were in a dangerous area. Um, but the people who lived there helped get them back to safety and they all like worked together to build this runway. It's really cool. Yeah, you can actually, you can read the book written about it. Um, it's called The Forgotten 500 by Gregory Freeman. It's a great book. Do you have like a favorite historical event? I know some people have like a, just like, you know, that one historical yeah. event that Pete that always stuck with them or a Not handful? really. I mean, yeah, probably a handful. Like, I, I mean, I'm always interested because my grandparents were in the army in World War II. So I think like World War II, that period, um, I tend to read a lot of historical fiction and nonfiction about it, but also, just growing up in Willowick, this um, is Willow Beach Amusement Park on the cover. And that was close to where I grew up and where I was a kid and rode my bike past it. And now it's, um, it's like a neighborhood beach club. So people who live there can belong to this private club. And there's a pavilion that we believe is one of the original pavilions that still has the same shape of the roof that you can see here. Um, so it wasn't just like one event, like it's not like just one event happened there, mm -hmm. but just the story behind the amusement park and that it was so close to where I was, you know, was as a child um, has always been interesting to me. And then 50 years before the amusement park was there, there was the G.P. Griffith shipwreck. So that was at the same location and knowing like, I mean, they're so contradictory, like a terrible, terrible, tragic shipwreck that's still among the worst three in all the Great Lakes. And an amusement park was built there years later. Um, that was really the base for me wanting to write this book and is one of those events that just sticks with me. 
Are like remains from the like amusement park still there, or was it all torn down? Yeah. So yeah. So the one of these. I don't want to mess this up. Okay, if you can see in the top corner, um, it's like a pyramid-shaped roof, and there is still a pavilion that it, the four pillars that used to be round have been enclosed, like they look, you know, more square. Um, and the park members believe that they did that, like probably in the 60s or 70s, to modernize it. But it's still, if you compare maps, like I've looked at old historic maps, it's in the same spot from the time that the amusement park was there to today. Like it hasn't changed. And then I actually realized from an old map, I've been to this park and I've done book signings there. Thank you. Yeah. And um, there is a big rectangular um, cement slab that they've used for, you know, riding bikes and they used to have basketball hoops. And I was like, wait a second, if I compare all the maps, that looks like it's where the big dance hall used to be, which is cool to see like, kind of like figure out all these years later what the layout, you know, was like back mm -hmm. then. That's really cool though. We're, like when, when you were like a little kid, did you ever like climb on any of that stuff or? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, so across from um, Shoregate, where now there are, Lair, it's a Laramar home development, it used to just be woods. And there was um, a ravine, and I believe it's the ravine that a coaster, a car coaster used to go down into that was part of the amusement park. And I remember going down there, um, I don't know whose property it was at the time, but I remember a lot of people would go and you could see like these cement footers. And I don't know if it was from the coaster, it was from something related to the amusement park. Um, and you know, those are gone uh, because they, they built in that area. But I do think there are still some poles, like light poles at the beach club that were from the original Willow Beach. And I wanna go back there and dig around a little bit more um, it's private, so only only upon invitation. But um, it's just a it's a cool place for me to visit. Did you ever find any like little trinkets, like bottles or coins oh, from there? That would no? be so oh, cool. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah, that would be the ultimate. I saw someone once on I think it was on Facebook posted that they have this little glass cup, and it says Willow Beach, and it's like a really pretty, like almost like this color, like a red. And it was a prize that they won cool. um, yeah, when it was an amusement park. So I'm like, if you ever want to sell it, I would love to, <laughs> I would love to buy it. But they're, right now they're holding on to it. But yeah, that would be like the ultimate to go there and find some piece mm -hmm. left over from it would be very cool. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. So make sure to check out Jennifer Engelking's book, Hidden History of Wake County, and we will see you in our next interview.